Good afternoon and welcome to Campaign Legal Center's virtual book event, Trevor Potter in conversation with Catherine Gale. I'm Sandhya Bathija, Chief Communications Officer here at Campaign Legal Center. CLC is a national nonpartisan organization that works to advance democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels. We fight for every American's right to participate in the democratic process, and we believe that our democracy should be transparent, accountable, and inclusive. Before I turn it over to the speakers this afternoon, I wanted to review a few housekeeping items with you. First, please use the comment section on Facebook or YouTube to submit your questions for Trevor and Catherine. At the end of the discussion, we will do our best to get to each question, but in the interest of time, we may not be able to answer every question. Um, if we're not able to answer all the questions and you're the member and you're a member of the press, so you can send um, your questions through email to media at campaignlegal.org. And if you're a member of the public um, and we cannot get to your question today, you can send it to campaign legal, info at campaignlegal.org. Um, now I'd like to introduce Trevor Potter, CLC's president and former Republican commissioner and chair of the Federal Election Commission. He will discuss the book, Politics, The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy, with one of the book's authors, Catherine Gale. Thank you, and now I'll turn it over to Trevor. Thank you, Sandia, very much, and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, again, I'm Trevor Potter, uh, CLC president and uh, former Republican commissioner and chair of the Federal Election Commission. Uh, I am delighted that Catherine Gale can join us today. She is one of uh, the two authors uh, of The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. Catherine is a political innovation and business leader and a world-renowned economist. In the book, Catherine and her co-author, Michael E. Porter, take a fresh, nonpartisan deep dive into American politics and argue that the political system is working exactly how it is designed to work because it isn't designed and optimized to work for the public interest, but rather for private interest and partisan interests. Uh, CLC first met Catherine uh, through the Wisconsin redistricting case, Whitford, a couple years ago, she reached out to our legal team and was helpful to us in that case. And we started a conversation about how to change our political system, not only through redistricting reform and nonpartisan commissions, but in other ways. So we're really pleased to have a chance to talk with her today about her book. In it, uh, she and Michael Porter apply a competition lens drawn from business to government and politics to explore what they call the politics industrial theory and why a lack of competition threatens American democracy. This theory centers the Democratic Party and the Republican Party as a duopoly and places surrounding actors and dimensions of politics into what they call the five forces framework, developed originally to understand industry structure. So I'd like to start uh, by throwing a first question to Catherine. We're going to have a conversation for a while, and then we're going to turn to questions from our audience. Uh, so Catherine, what prompted you to write this book? Uh, that is a good question because it, it certainly wasn't my initial intention. But before I answer that, let me just say, uh, I totally remember when I reached out to the Campaign Legal Center. And what I want the audience to know is the response that I got and everything I've done with CLC since then has been so impressive. So sometimes you see an organization that's for something and you're excited by it. But then when you work with the organization or the company or the product or whatever, it isn't all you thought it would be. And that was never the case with the Campaign Legal Center. And I think we're so fortunate to have you and your organization in this ecosystem of, of change and upholding democracy. So that's 
I just need Thank to say. You. I'm so pleased that we came as advertised. Yes, you, yes, you did. Okay, so I'm adding to the advertising. All right, so now why did I decide to write this book? Well, I got involved in politics because I'm a citizen, a business owner, a parent. So the way other people do, you know, we look at the world and we say, oh, we're part of this great American experiment and we need to vote and care about what's going on. And I became very disillusioned with the political system and its ability to actually solve any problems. So there was a point in time when I got beyond caring about who was being elected. And I got to the point where I was saying, what are they doing? And it was really pretty disappointing to discover that no matter who was elected uh, and how talented they were or, or what their ideology was, the results were reasonably similar as in gridlock and dysfunction and we never solved the big problems in a sustainable way. So I knew that was a problem and I wanted to engage business people, other business leaders in this and really business leaders were missing in action. And when I would take the, the case for reform for political innovation to business leaders, they really wanted almost nothing to do with it. And I ended up determining that to many business leaders, the political system seemed like so irrational and so crazy. They just couldn't get their mind around how it would be worth supporting, you know, with donations or leadership, any political innovation, because none of it made sense because they thought it worked in some different kind of way. So I wrote the book and used this competition lens with a clear priority of wanting to explain to the business community using the tools that they're familiar with in their own businesses, what's going on in politics. And the reason I wanted to use that lens is not because it's the only valid way to look at politics, but because I thought it was uniquely illustrative of the problem. And most importantly, it was it helps in a very unique way show what the, sol the best solutions are. Because all of this, and you know, there's a lot in the book, a lot of interesting stories about what's wrong, behind the scenes stories, and then there's a lot of analysis. But the point of all of that is to figure out what we're supposed to do. And so I wanted to do that for business leaders and then get them off the sidelines and, and we're having success, I'm really pleased. What sort of reaction have you had from business leaders and, and are they are they engaging with the book? Yeah, let me give you uh, an example from this morning. Uh, a CEO of a Fortune 100 company, really one of the largest companies in the world, uh, emailed after reading the book with a really detailed commentary on it and said that uh, he, this, this is a, a gentleman, wanted to be involved, um, a name people would know. And we had a wonderful one hour meeting this morning about what it's going to take to get, uh, you know, really well-known CEOs to talk not about anything partisan, but to talk about the need for competition and choice in order to drive results and accountability in politics. Uh, and he was, you know, I mean, he reached out to us because he thought it was so illuminating and important that we do that. Then I'll give you another example. So uh, I like this because it was July 4th. I came in after the fireworks, you know, all patriotism. And there was an email in my inbox and it was responding directly to what I write in the conclusion of the book. The last line in the book is something like, Michael, meaning my co-author, Michael and I are all in, are you? And so I got this email and the subject line was, I'm in. And then in the body was, what are next steps? And he is a you know wonderfully uh, successful CEO here in you know the United States. And so now we've been working together. And that is the resonance that the work has when described in this way. And we only need, you know, so many people to really raise their hand and say, I'm all in. Mm -hmm. And you know, too, at Campaign Legal Center, 
you definitely need supporters and more is better, but in some ways only a small number of people are gonna be actively involved and those are the ones that make the difference. And we're, we're moving forward on getting the amount of people that we need. Well, that's exciting that you're getting that kind of reaction and, and reaching the people you wanted to reach. In, in the book, you, you lay out sort of two halves. The first half is what the problem is, and the second is the solutions. And you mentioned what you were just saying, some of the problem, which is the political industrial complex and the lack of competition in politics. What, what do you see as the major features of this political uh, industrial complex, as you call it. Yes. So again, I say to your, uh, to the listeners, to the watchers here, bear with me while I explain this because it's helpful to understand again what we need to change. So let's to understand how politics isn't working. Let's first think about how most industries we engage with work. So if we're the customer and we want to buy a phone, our new cell phone, we have lots of choices. And the kind of cell phone that's available to us, to us today and the features it has and its cost, you know, its price point, it's all different than it was even five years ago, certainly 10 and 15 years ago, because the industry keeps making progress. And they make progress probably on their own profitability, they probably do, right? But for, from the customer's perspective, the part we're really seeing is they're making progress in what they're offering to us in the store. Oh, that's a better camera. Oh, that's better quality X or Y. I wanna buy that one. And that's the results and the innovation that we get. And if they also do well, if those custom companies also do well, well, that's sort of fine with us in general as customers. Now, what happens in the politics industry is we notice that what we're getting now as compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, isn't an appreciably better product. In fact, many people would argue that they are more dissatisfied with politics, candidates, and policy results than they were you know, five, uh, eight, 10 years ago. And that, brings up this fundamental question. How is it possible that everything we know to be associated with politics, like the parties, the campaign consultants, the lobbyists, the media, all the ads, all of that seems bigger and you can sort of understand more expensive, you know, more dollars in there than ever. And yet those of us that should be customers are more dissatisfied than ever. So approximately 90% of people disapprove of Congress. And yet the same people get elected and the money is bigger than it ever was. So that is a disconnect. And we've somehow thought that, you know, there's a disconnect we would never accept in the private markets. But we've sort of accepted it in politics as if that's the only way it could be, that we can only have these two parties and therefore, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. And the point, one of the key points of our book is, no, we absolutely are completely in control of the rules that have created this duopoly and we can break it open. And then we could create a system where the most important customer is the voter and where the political industrial complex, and again, that means the parties, the consultants, every, every business that's in there making money off of politics, that they would only be able to do well if the voters were getting what they needed from the system. We have to create that connection. And right now it's, it's not connected. The political industrial complex does well regardless of the voter. And in particular, the political industrial complex does well if special interests, donors, and party primary voters are happy. Mm -hmm. So you talk about a couple of solutions in the book, and I'd love to get into to some of those. Uh, you mentioned ranked choice voting, which I expect uh, a number of, of our uh, audience uh, are familiar with. And then you talk about the, the final five voting process, which I think people are less familiar with. So why those two solutions and, and what, what benefit would you see if we adopted them? 
Okay, so our core thesis is the political industrial complex, the parties, are not competing to solve our problems. Right now, as I just said, they're only competing to make donors, special interests, and party primary voters happy. So we need to, and because of that, we don't have in the politics industry innovation, we don't get results, and there's no accountability for not getting results because the current two choices that we have are guaranteed to continue to be the only two no matter how satisfied we are. So they don't have to serve us. They can do whatever they want and they still get to win. Okay, so because of that, we have to look at where we would intervene in the system to create a different dynamic, to create a different important customer and to create incentives for results and accountability. And we look, most importantly, at two key structural systems in how we vote. Because how we vote is essentially the job interview process, right? So that's how we say who gets to have the elected jobs. And the rules of who's gonna win is what in sense how they're going to behave. So that's the crux, that's where we have to go first. And the first problem we have is we have party controlled primaries. So you have a democratic primary and a Republican primary. And that pushes our elected officials far to the right and to the left. Now people are familiar with this because they watch campaigns and they see what people say. But what I wanna invite the audience to consider is some, there's something a lot more important than what people say while they're trying to get elected. It's what they do once they're elected. And there we see the influence of the party controlled primary is devastating. So just picture Congress, I'm very focused on Congress. Now you have a bipartisan compromise bill, let's say on one of our biggest issues, you know, immigration, healthcare, debt, deficit, uh, infrastructure. And you want to, you know, get the votes to pass it. Well, the, each elected official has to look at it and figure out if it's a good bill, yes. But the other thing they have to figure out is, will I make it back through my party controlled primary if I vote for this? And the answer to that question for a bipartisan compromise bill on a complex issue with trade-offs is virtually always no. Because the Democrats can't you know, vote yes on anything where you're gonna get maybe a dollar of benefit decrease and the Republicans can't vote yes if you're gonna get a dollar of tax increase. And that's just the stereotype. But my point is they, their election system, the party controlled primaries make it impossible for them to work together, full stop. So we can talk about all the other things we want, but if by doing their jobs, as in voting yes on a good bill, um, equates to losing their jobs, that's a crazy design. So we got to fix party controlled primaries. The second thing is that we have plurality voting in this country. And plurality voting, also known as first past the post voting, is just this idea that whoever has the most votes wins. Now that seems at first blush super normal. Yeah, most votes you win. But it turns out it's quite a problem because in any election of more than two candidates, someone can win with less than a majority. So they have, you know, 40% of the votes, but not over 50%. And 35% in Maine. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Now, I would say that the, and, and that's why, as many of your audience knows, why we want to implement ranked choice voting. But here's a real difference between the lens that that I have in in this book and what many people have about ranked choice voting. So there's a big feeling that ranked choice voting is more fair, more representative, more democratic. And I think it's all of those things. And I think it gives an opportunity for more people to participate in a viable way. However, that's not why it's my top priority. It's my top priority because it gets, if we put in ranked choice voting, now we'll have new competition. We'll have 
more people able to run outside of the tr traditional duopoly because they won't be spoilers or wasted votes. And competition, as we discussed at the beginning, is what drives the existing competitors, Democrats and Republicans, to be better at what they're doing or else they know they could get replaced by a new party or replaced by independents. So I, I focus less on making things more fair and democratic, although I love that, because what really is needed is results. And this new competition provides accountability for delivering results in the legislature, and that's what people really want. And the fact that it's combined with also our deepest ideals is perfect, but we can't just get caught up in wanting things to be, sort of want to be better represented in a system that solves nothing. We wanna be better represented in a system that's going to solve our problems. And then for that reason, we put the two solutions together. We get rid of party controlled primaries and we have open top five primaries. So it's just one ballot. The top five vote getters advance to the general election. And then we have a dynamic diverse debate between these five candidates and then use ranked choice voting in the general election to determine the ultimate winner. Together, we call that package final five voting. Open top five primary plus ranked choice voting general election. And that is the combination of changes to how we vote that changes the incentives so that what is now incented are innovation, results, and accountability. The general election is more important than the primary election. Votes begin to have more power than money. And we begin to see that the customer who's most important is now the public interest rather than as I said before, the donors' special interests and party primary voters. So it's really an amazing intervention. Is there a magic to the five number? California has the top two. You obviously looked at that and thought that wasn't as good as you wanted. How? What's your thinking on, on that? I understand that the point is you want people to go to the general election and then you want to have ranked choice voting so that you end up with one person who's got the majority of support. I'm just curious where the five came from. Yeah, uh, it is a good question. Now, let me say something. There is, and you'll know this, but I'll say for everybody, you know, there is no perfect system mm. that, that will always give us always the likelihood of getting results from our legislature. But again, what I invite people to do is stop asking themselves only the questions of how will this system change who wins? And instead ask the question, how will this system change what the winners do? Mm -hmm. And for that reason, uh, two is not enough. So like what California has two, top two, is better than just having a closed party controlled primary, no question. And that's what California had before. So kudos to those people who got it to this open top two primary. But two does continue to reinforce the duopoly. Uh -huh. and meaning it's often a Democrat or a Republican, or it could be competition within the Republican party, but we haven't really created an opportunity for new startups to say, hey, most people actually, they might consider themselves Democrats and Republicans, but they'd be happy if they were doing better. You know, even people who are in these parties aren't always that satisfied. So yet they haven't opened up the competition enough. So, so that's why we need more than two. The second thing though is we keep thinking again about the election as figuring out who's gonna win, but we also need to think about the election process as being the time when we are engaged in the most dialogue with the officials, mm -hmm. which is to say they're gonna have debates, they're gonna be making their case to us. And this is when their priorities are getting set or they're being held accountable for the priorities that they had before. So we need more truth tellers. So one of the things we see in the existing duopoly is because there's only two and both of them spend way more money than we have they don't really tell on each other. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we need to have at least three, right? Because now we need someone who could sort of tell the truth and they don't have to collude to hide up the messiness behind the scenes. But we also want to have, we want the campaign to be not just about who's going to win, but we also want to have a campaign of ideas. So a lot of times people will say to me, because I happen to be politically homeless, but behind that I am pretty centrist, you know, independent. So they think that I want a squishy middle. And I don't. The way the world works, both in private industry and in politics, is that it's driven progress by innovation. And when innovation occurs, it doesn't usually spring up from the middle. Okay, like I don't think you would say that the creation of the United States in the first place was a centrist kind of idea, right? These are fringe ideas. And when Steve Jobs would have a new innovation, it wasn't a committee driven, you know, squishy middle kind of thing. Innovation happens, you know, all over, but oftentimes out here. So with five, Trevor, we have space for new we ideas. The fringes. We protect ideological difference. We protect a range in the debate, but then we combine that diverse dynamic debate with electing someone out of that debate who doesn't just appeal to some you know, vocal minority, but instead has broad support. So we allow the winner to be impacted by the broad and diverse debate, but nonetheless be empowered to get deals done in what's possible in Congress instead of just stand for some idea that we can never move on because we kind of need to move incrementally in many cases in a democracy. But over time, if you have enough debate like that, ideas that were fringe will no longer be. If they're valid, you know, they'll move into the mainstream. And that's why I absolutely believe we need five. So we'll have parties, we'll have independents, we'll have new upstarts, and then we'll have these diverse ideas like Andrew Yang, Maybe if we had this five, you know, he was for uh, universal basic income, maybe there would be a Yang candidate kind of making that case. And I'm not speaking for or against that policy, but I'm saying, how exciting would that be instead of this tired old debate between red and blue? Mm -hmm. No innovation is coming out of that, that's for sure. So here's a, uh, an additional data point for you and in, in your argument that the two parties uh, essentially sort of have a duopoly that they've negotiated. Several years ago, the party campaign committees uh, essentially agreed with each other that they would not file FEC complaints saying that the candidates of the other party had done something wrong because neither party's lawyers were interested in having the FEC enforce the election laws and they didn't want investigations so they just generally agreed to a truce. So the, with the FEC can't do anything unless a complaint is filed and there's an informal, unwritten, as far as I know, uh, truce out there so that the only people who actually now enforce the laws are group like ours as, as outside watchdogs. And the candidates who were seeing the violations then are discouraged from, from filing. So that's a, an example of what you're talking about. Yeah, let me, let me again draw a parallel to how this works differently than private industry. And now I'm not here saying that, you know, that our current system of capitalism and what business is doing doesn't need also some you know, improvement. It certainly does, but here's the thing. Private industry is regulated by antitrust laws and it's regulated by government, which you know sort of says, oh, you can't put these unsafe products out there, or now you've gotten too powerful and you uh, and that's bad for the customer, or you're price fixing and you're not allowed to price fix with your competitor. Well, what the Democrats and the Republicans are doing is price fixing, or they're or they're colluding on these rules, as we said. I won't tell on you. You don't tell on me. And this is interesting. Who regulates the politics industry? Well, they themselves make the rules, meaning they set up the FEC in the first place. And then they said, now, and you would know this better than I as the former co-chair of the, now let's staff the SEC with these specific people who come from us, you know? And then, and then now they say, oh, and let's not even go to the FEC. I mean, it's so appalling. And 
I actually feel that all the focus on money and politics has really taken our eye off the ball of the rules of the game that are the ones that make the money end up mattering. It's not the money itself in the way people think it is. It's that these rules of the game make it more important than votes. And so um, we can change these rules and we have to be calling them out. And you can believe it. If there was a third that was viable, they'd be able to complain about that vociferously. Right now, thirds complain all the time that they can't get on the debate stage, but nobody cares because they can't win anyway. But if all of a sudden we opened up competition and they were able to uh, you know, influence the results of an election, then a lot of things would be uncovered for us. Right, and they're not independents on the debate commissions and they're not independents on the Federal Election Commission in any mm -hmm. real sense. The FEC is actually worse than you described because having done all of this and colluded to make sure that they don't file complaints, they then, commissioners resigned and they were not replaced. And so the commission currently does not have a quorum and can't do a thing in this election year. And uh, last spring, there was a big push by Mitch McConnell to put a Republican on the commission. The Democrats said, well, how about some Democrats at the same time? We've always done one of each party. And McConnell said, no, it's an emergency. We have to get a quorum. No sooner was the new Republican put on than the old Republican resigned and they are back to no quorum. So you know, there really is a, a uh, collusion at the highest political so, partisan levels in Washington to defang the watchdog. So I just, you know, it's amazing to me that I'm in this and I still, every time I hear a new story of the conclusion, I manage to be like, really? They d so I wanna say, so what you're saying is really, the, the quote, old Republican resigned in order to not have a quorum and they just are saying, let's just keep it toothless, toothless, toothless. And did Mitch McConnell know it was going to be kept toothless and just, I mean. I think so, because what happened was McConnell rushed through the one Republican to give them a quorum, violating all the traditions of the Senate to do that. Literally within five or six days, the existing Republican on the commission got off uh, and the White House that day announced an intent to nominate someone else, which means they knew in advance. They couldn't have done it that quickly. And if the White House knew, McConnell knew. So what they wanted was one Republican on the commission so that there would be a Republican voice, but not a quorum so they couldn't do anything. Uh, it's yeah, and you know, we need to, I, I, I'm sort of smiling, you know, like as, as I was getting this story from him, I'm like, oh, I can't believe they did that. Like in a, almost like a gossipy kind of way. That was my, no. when coming across probably. Let's step back for a moment and say to our audience, and I mean, this is so egregious, this behavior. And yet we talk about it like it's another episode of the soap opera. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm trying to do, and, and you are trying, you know, we need to bring forth the horror and, and the outrageousness of this takeover of the system that belongs to us and the, and the, the hubris now of the players to believe that whatever machinations they need to take behind the scenes, it's all fine, it's all fine. If it's technically legal, it's all fine. There's no bar anymore. Or it's, or it's clearly illegal, but there is no enforcement agency, yeah. no cop on the beat. The whole issue with the Hatch Act and the ethics rules is you right. can look at them and say, yes, it's a violation, but we are not set up to do anything about that violation. And your point, I think, is if you had people in Congress who were not polarized and partisan, they would hold the government accountable in a way that today just doesn't happen. Yeah, because there's, it's much harder to collude, you know, when there's this odd number or there's new entrance because the new entrance will be coming and saying, I'm not, I'm specifically appealing to yep. my potential voters on the fact that I'm not part of this colluded, you know, duopoly. So look, the only way around this stuff is competition.
because we can make more rules like the ones that already exist and don't get enforced. But if you leave the duopoly and you leave them the promise that no matter what they do, they get to keep being the only two, mm -hmm. there's no rules. There's no constitutional amendment. There's no regulatory body. There's no nothing we're going to be able to do about it. Competition is the freeing hand of, of the market, you know, that forces it to benefit the people. Mm -hmm. And we, it's, it's why I, there are lots of things we should fix, lots, in our democracy. It's why I focus on final five voting as the most important right now, because opening up the system to new competition is what would make the other reforms we might want to enact matter. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's do the competition first. So let me remind our audience that you are welcome to put questions in uh, to the chat and then we will get to them in, in a moment. Uh, so go ahead and do so, please. Uh, so I think the logical question back to you, Catherine, having heard what you've just said in, in passionately, and I think clearly laying out why we need this change, is how do we get it? How does it happen? How do we get from where we are to, to where we should be? Yeah, I'm amazed by the answer to this question that you just asked me, which is that when I first understood this answer, I thought, oh, this can't be true. And I mean that actually in a good way. Mm -hmm. So I want you to picture two circles. And one is everything every kind of reform that we could implement in politics that is powerful. And by that, I mean any reform that would affect the results that Congress delivers. Okay, there's other reforms, but they don't change results. So powerful to me is you're gonna change the incentives to solve real problems. And then the other circle would be whether that, every innovation that's achievable, as in we can make it happen, Mm -hmm. So, for example, in the achievable bucket, I don't put things in there that require constitutional amendments, not because they're never going to be achievable. Someday they are, but because they're not achievable in the next, you know, two to six years. Then we overlap these, everything that would be powerful to do, along with everything that we could actually do, everything that's doable and worth doing. And there's only a few things that are in both of these circles. Mm -hmm. And shockingly, shockingly, the thing that I thought was most powerful, which is opening up competition through final five voting and changing the incentives to deliver results, is also in the scheme of things, super achievable. Now that doesn't mean it's easy. It just means it's possible. So here's how we do it. Article one of the Constitution gives all the power to make the rules of the election to each state individually. That's why when we watch the presidential elections, we're always like, wait, how come Nevada does it this way? And these guys, you know, South Dakota does it this way and Massachusetts, some other crazy way. Like, how could they not all do this the same? Well, because the Constitution says every state can do it differently. And most states, though, have the elections for Congress relatively the same. And now we go to each of those states and we, which means those of us that decide we want to change the rules in that state, and we are essentially saying to the citizens and the legislature of that state, we want to change the rules of the game for elections to the Senate and the House of Representatives. And and in each of the 50 states, there is, there's essentially one or two methods to do that. Any state could have their state legislature pass the bill and the governor could sign it. And then their federal delegation, their senators and Congress people would be elected under these new rules. Half of the states also could skip that. So half of the states have the ability to do what's called a ballot initiative, which means that they don't, they can, a group of citizens 
can come together and collect signatures to get a question, a question put on the ballot at their next election. And then when the citizens of that state would go in to vote for the candidates for governor or Senate or House, after they vote for the candidates, they would essentially see, do you want to vote yes or no on final five voting for Congress? And then the citizens would vote. And if they get over you know, 50%, then that wins. And then now that's the law. Now that's a little simplistic because there's a lot of business for Campaign Legal Center in um, defending you know, what citizens say they want. But essentially it goes that way. You're going to pass a law through the legislature or you're going to get the law at the ballot box uh, with the citizens. And it's it's hard, but it's it's totally doable because in the ballot initiatives, the key question is, can you invest enough resources to get this information out to the citizens? Because the citizens want to be the most powerful customers of the democracy. The citizens want everybody who works for us to be accountable to us. So if you can get the message out, the citizens vote yes. It's hard to get the message out, but when you can, they vote yes. Very exciting, there is a ballot initiative for final four voting on the ballot in Alaska for this November 3rd. So I say to the audience, when you're uh, watching the returns and, and looking at which candidates are winning, please do also, you'll have to search on the internet. I don't think they're gonna cover it at CNBC, but cover, you know, look and see what um, is happening in Alaska, because I call that the other swing state, which is what, where's our democracy going? Are we gonna pass it or not? Um, and then the, so my point is, so we're gonna pass laws, we're gonna do this, but here's what's really interesting, Trevor. We don't have to see the rules of elections changed in every single state before we see results and a change in, in how Congress is acting. Because if you change these rules, let's say in only five states, so Alaska plus four others in 2022 maybe, then you would have 10 senators and maybe let's say 50 representatives who are going to Washington DC under different incentives. These are now senators who are answering to not just their party primary voters, but to their entire state and representatives who are answering to the general electorate. They're not under the thumb of party leadership in the way currently people are because they can't be primaried out. Mm -hmm. They can't be primaried out. And they also know that their job is not protected. They know that if they don't keep their campaign promises, someone is actually gonna be able to run against them in the next election and point that out powerfully to the voters. So they could still all be Republicans and Democrats and have quote unquote that ideology, but they're incented differently to keep their jobs. So now these 10 senators could serve as a fulcrum of people who are very oriented on problem solving in the public interest because that customer is more important to those 10, no matter whether they're Republicans, Democrats or independents, than, uh, than are the special interests and donors, for example. So this is super powerful and the results are achievable in years, not decades. And I can't wait to see what happens with Alaska. We should go for it. Massachusetts has a ranked choice voting uh, proposal ballot initiative as well. Am I right? Absolutely. I'm actually on the board of that effort in Massachusetts. So Massachusetts has this ballot initiative. They'll vote on ranked choice voting, which is a key piece of what I call final five voting as the system. I will be, I mean, I'm very involved there. It's run, the campaign is run by Kara McCormick, who won the RCV campaign in Maine. She is a huge you know, talent and someone we're lucky to have in this political innovation ecosystem. So after they win, I will be kind of pinning my hopes that Massachusetts will uh, in 2022 or 24, follow up their RCV win with a top five primaries ballot initiative and put the two pieces together. Because in this case, I support both of these 
uh, you know, changes individually, but it's not one plus one equals two. Mm-hmm. Open top five primaries plus ranked choice voting general elections is like one plus one equals 10, in my view. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's, it, it, to me, it's, it's interesting that you, you, you place the faith in the initiative process because one of the things that CLC has discovered over these last couple of years is that the two parties uh, and the establishment fight tooth and nail uh, to prevent initiatives. Even in the half states that allow it, uh, they then challenge the text in the state court system saying it's not one issue as some states require or it's not clear or they violated some other technicality and they try to get it thrown out in court. So CLC ended up, for instance, in the the Michigan redistricting battle, spending months and months and months in all sorts of courts before the election, just to make sure the citizens actually could vote on the idea um, with uh, the the one party in particular fighting it every step of the way. And then once it got passed, uh, the, suits were filed again saying it was unconstitutional so you know there is almost a a kind of um you know body reaction to some sort of alien transplant <laughs> it it tries to reject it uh because they didn't come up with the idea uh you're absolutely right and interestingly i personally put m- my time much more in legislative efforts. So I come from Wisconsin and we don't have ballot initiatives there. And in the fall of 2017, I co-founded with uh, another Wisconsin CEO, Austin Ramirez, an organization called Democracy Found. And our goal is to convince the legislature and the governor to pass this bill on behalf of the people in Wisconsin and you know, and, and the governor to sign it. And that takes a lot longer, but I think could have more stain power and engender less uh, of this kind of underhanded manipulation that we see because you're not gonna pass it unless you're getting broad buy-in. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's an, that takes effort and time, which we're you know, really working on in Wisconsin. And I'm so pleased to say that we have bipartisan co-sponsors in the Wisconsin legislature. Uh, they wrote, actually, it's, if any of your viewers wanted to Google it, um, Senator, State Senator Dale Kringa, conservative Republican in Wisconsin, co-authored with uh, State Representative Daniel Reamer, a Democrat from Milwaukee in Wisconsin, an op-ed in our major Wisconsin newspaper, the Journal Sentinel, saying essentially, you know, we're all complaining about Congress and guess what? We in the state legislature are in charge of this. You know, we're in charge of these rules and we don't agree on everything, you know, policy-wise, but we agree on our love of country. They both serve in the military, you know, we we're here for the same reasons to make progress for the country. And we believe that it's our responsibility to change these rules and we wanna change them to final five voting. Mm-hmm. Now that's extraordinary. And, and by the way, that op-ed came out just, you know, in the spring here when there was national talk about how divided Wisconsin was. People are not divided on whether Congress functions right now. I keep saying, you say we can't pass this in the legislature. I say, look, you guys, there's only one thing that Democrats, Republicans, and independents all agree on right now, and that's that Congress is broken. Mm -hmm. Everybody agrees on that. Nobody agrees whether the presidency or the president is broken or not. Nobody agrees on whether the state legislature is broken or not, but Congress, it's pretty universal. Is that why you focus on Congress. I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions in the chat, and one of the questions is, why Congress? Why not try to change state legislatures? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, so I you know, sold my company five years ago. I come from business, and 
one of the things that I've always lived by in business is this maxim that strategy is about choosing what not to do. Because there's so many things that need doing. So strategy about choosing what not to do. We've chosen to focus on Congress. There are multiple reasons for that. And one of them really is this idea that let's start with something we all agreed on because it's still going to take a lift. So let's start where we all agree. If you want to add into that something where we don't all agree, now we're going to not all agree on the whole package. You know, so you take something we all agree on that Congress has broken and you pollute it with something we don't all agree on, like you try to change the presidential primary system at the same time, or you try to change the legislative system of elections at the same time, and now you don't all agree. So you've just really taken, I believe, the effort out of that intersection of powerful and achievable. Now, what I didn't want to do is when strategy is about choosing what not to do, that doesn't mean choose things just because they're achievable, even if they're not powerful. I mean, that would be silly. Mm -hmm. So it's super powerful to change Congress, super powerful. So that's powerful enough. So I don't need to be greedy and try to change every other thing when it makes it less achievable. And the second reason is one of the, there's two reasons why it becomes less achievable. One, as I just indicated, is that you you're no longer starting with something with a premise that has such broad agreement across ideology. But the second thing is, is you are going to get more opposition because in a state where you're asking the legislature to change the rules, they gotta change them then on their own heads, mm -hmm. the rules of their own elections. I mean, they're, it's gonna be hard for them to do that calculus, like, well, is this good? You know, so it's just, a, we don't need to go there Let's start and have our victories. And then also let's have a little humility, um, which is we should see how this goes. Now I'm super confident it's gonna change behavior that in large part we like to see, but let's see how this goes. And uh, we have laboratories of democracy in the country. Now we get to benefit from them. We pass this in multiple states and we see how people from those states begin to uh, perform in Congress and, and what legislation they're able to move forward. And then we will know when we want to change it. And, and we'll demystify it. One thing I say to people all the time, well, I say when I talk to politicians, you know, we're not, um, we're not getting rid of any jobs. We're going to have the exact same number of senators and same number of representatives. So there are the jobs. It's not job killing. Mm -hmm. And if, so if you want to have that job, you can have that job. The job is still there. And actually, unless you're Senate or House leadership, your job is better. Your job is better. Now you actually have as a senator or representative the freedom to do what you know needs doing. You have the freedom to do what all your constituents want. You don't have to vote. You don't have to have lockstep allegiance at every moment to the party line of your one side when behind closed doors, that's not what you believe, but because of the party controlled primary system right now, you have no other option. This is something that people will get behind, which I will, you know this gentleman, uh, Congressman Mike Gallagher, a Republican from Wisconsin. He wrote the forward to our book along with uh, Congresswoman Chrissy Gallagher from Pennsylvania, a Democrat, so a Democrat Republican who wrote the foreword. And Mike Gallagher has been phenomenally supportive of this. And his message in part to his, to his fellow congresspeople is, this is great for us. We can really do what we wanna do here. Mm -hmm. And automatically people think with change, you know, we're trying to sort of change who wins. And, I, and I'll say it once again, I just want to change uh, what the winners are incented to do. And I don't have any problem with Democrats, Republicans. I don't have any problem with parties. I don't have any problem. I don't even have any problem with only two parties, as long as they're not guaranteed to remain the only two, mm -hmm. which is to say, I think sometimes when you have this new competition, the new competition may or may not end up winning. They may just change what the current duopoly does. And you know, that's fine with me. 
So um, there are a number of questions about campaign finance in terms of why not focus on them or uh, so forth. Let me free, let me pull them together into one question, which is uh, clearly one of the problems we have in our political system today is the influence of huge spending in politics and the power that major donors or major spenders have. And part of that, I think you identified already in talking about the problem of party primaries, because it isn't just that the base rises up with pitchforks because they're angry that someone in Congress was bipartisan, mm -hmm. it is that they have received communications costing millions of dollars from special interests who didn't like that vote in Congress, who want to set an example and keep everyone else in line, who want to punish the person who broke the party discipline on whatever the issue was. You know, on the Democratic side, it may be union spending or it may be uh, a pro-choice issue. On the Republican side, it may be taxes or all sorts mm -hmm. of things. But um, that money does shape the elections uh, currently in the primaries, but I guess the question is, wouldn't it still? And then the parallel question, which is, uh, many reformers talk about a public financing system for Congress as a way of enabling people who are not personally wealthy or not the candidates of a wealthy interest to be able to run. And if you have a uh, top five uh, general election, they're all going to need resources to campaign. So I, I think the question all of that pulls together is, can you make the changes you want without also addressing campaign finance reform and finding ways uh, to get non-corrupting resources to candidates? It's such an important question. I agree with the people who ask those questions and anyone else who is concerned about this pervasive negative influence on, of money in politics. Nonetheless, for me, and again, I'll go back to as a business person, mm -hmm. I just wanna be really in sync with what's, what reality is which is that I think it's very easy and defensible to make a huge argument about what's wrong with money in politics and, and you can get very outraged about it. Again, it's, and, and you would be right to do so. But the question is not, are you right about how bad it is? The question is, are you right about what needs to be done to fix it? Or are you right that fixing it is even in the intersection of powerful and achievable in the first place? Because if you're not right about how to fix it or whether it's fixable, then you will have to be outraged about that for your entire life, which will help no one. Mm -hmm. You know, meaning we need to change, not just be outraged. Now, so what I think is we need to figure strategy about choosing what not to do. And strategy is also about what choosing what not to do now, which sort of means let's do something first and then maybe there's something we should do next. And I would put money in politics as a next thing. And there's two reasons for that. First, we, when we get real clear with reality, we understand that there's money in politics because it gets a really, really good ROI. I mean, people, the, people who have money in general have been good investors. They've invested in things where they got a good return and they wouldn't be putting their money in politics if it wasn't giving them what they wanted from that money. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to artificially reduce the amount of money in politics by let's say a factor of 10, here, let me, let me start over. I would suggest to people are concerned about this. If we were successful in first, reducing the money of politics by a factor of 10, but we didn't change any of the rules about party controlled primaries or competition, you know, then what we would effectively do is just make it 10 times cheaper for that money to get the same self-interested result. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't change those underlying rules of the game. 
So what we should do is first change the rules of the game and then all by itself, we started to reduce the return that the money gives. So now people will spend less of their money because they're getting less in return instead of we try to artificially reduce it. Now money's always gonna have power. I'm not clueless. I totally get that. That makes, that makes sense. I wanna ask, can I squeeze one oh, last question? Please, yeah, sorry. Very close to our end. And I think you answered that one comprehensively. So my last one is the softball, which is how do people make this happen? Where can they get started? Uh, one of the questions was, is there a model bill anywhere I can find it? So to the audience, what, are they, what can they do next? Okay, I am going to say, please go to my website, which is political-innovation.org. You can say there that you're interested in Final Five voting, and on my staff, someone will get back to you to help you know, is there a campaign in your state, or do you need to start one in your state? Um, there are, I mean, there's the bill that we're working on, Wisconsin. So there's a lot of resources out there. I'm still building my organization to be able to respond to the incoming. But the whole point of the organization I founded is to take interest that's generated from discussions like these and make sure we help people turn it into actions they can take. So political-innovation.org, that's my organization. And then I would also really, I would love it if you guys would buy my book, The Politics Industry because I'm trying to get a lot of us to sort of think and talk similarly about the problem so we can kind of be on the same page as we try to get action. So I'd really appreciate that as well. And, uh, you know, super fun to be here, Trevor. I mean, I can only imagine the great audience that you have. It's a great conversation. I, you've really illuminated this and, and I think made it clear to people as to why this is your top priority and why you think it really can change everything else because we all know that these rules are the gateway to policy results in a, in a good uh, democracy. And, and I noticed uh, in the chat uh, that we now have the information on where to purchase your book. Uh, so the link right there. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us today and for teaching us a lot. Uh, those who haven't read the book, I expect, based on this conversation, will rush off and do so. Thank you for teaching me a lot over these years, Trevor, and for everything your organization does. And thanks to the viewers who spent this time. We look forward to working together. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us.